Book group with Mary. Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. Chapter 9, Session 1. 29th of August, 2012. Wondai, Queensland, Australia. Um, how are you guys? Not too bad. <laughs> Thank you. It's really nice to see all of you. Genuinely, really nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, has it been a bit bumpy the last seven weeks? Yeah. You bet. <laughs> I heard a rumour <laughs> that just about everyone's had a bit of a, a rough trot. So, what's that about, do you reckon? Hooks? Addictions. What, living in them or challenging them or what do you think? Challenging, challenging them. Challenging. Good, good, good. <laughs> yep, do you want to just use them? Yeah, pass that. Thanks, Pierre. <laughs> yeah, just the um, challenging addictions and the resistance in me to being humble. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So making the action to challenge them and then going, oh, I don't really want to feel about this. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, we didn't have a book group while we were away because we were busy doing other stuff in the end, it turned out. So we're up to chapter nine. Are you guys ready for chapter nine? <laughs> You've had a fair bit of preparation time. <laughs> Who just got sick of it and went on and read the rest of the book? And Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and the next one. And the next one. That's, it's the kind of book you can read again and again, though, isn't it? So, yeah. All right. So uh, today our session is Chapter 9, Through the Mists, The Harvest of Jealousy. So who wants to share their initial uh, impressions of this chapter? <coughs> no one? Mon? Um. <coughs> that um, I was quite um, overwhelmed with how much um, service and um, the, um, that Krishna would give his time and his life and his house and his, his home, his whole, everything inside of him to help someone. And that made me reflect on my guides and what they do. And so often I don't feel worthy enough. Like I tell them, you should just go like like you must have other life you know it's something better to do than sit here with me and and also that makes me feel about service that has been given to me by by you and AJ and how that there's a big gap in my life how I want to serve because I don't really want to yeah yeah, thanks, Mon. There's a lot in this chapter about service, isn't there? Yeah, who wants to just give us a summary of what happens in the first half, or the first little bit, what's happening in the beginning of the chapter, the service that Mon's talking about? If you pass back to Sandra. Yep. Hi, Mary. Hi. If you sit a bit closer, Sandra, it'll mean it's easier to pass the mic to you. So the chapter is about um, the fact that <laughs> it's such a beautiful chapter, I love it. Uh, they go down. They degrade. In, they, they go down in condition to meet a woman that's very special to Krishna because of what she's been through. Yeah. And um, so they have to change their appearance in order to be, not to frighten her. That's how I understood it. And they see a beautiful friendship between her and her guide. Um, and yeah, and Fred just really embraces, like, just loves looking at at that, how beautiful the, and you can't see the difference between the two, yeah. besides in their condition. And yeah. So what does Fred notice about, so Fred and Kushna go on this new adventure, don't they? They're going through this uh, amazing landscape that we get to hear about again, don't we? And what does Fred notice? The he, changes, the, the changes. darkness, the mist, that, and he feels cold and the flowers and everything just kind of trees shrivel and... Yeah, it just becomes very apparent to him that it's a very different place to where he's been and where he came from. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then they come upon, what's the scene they come upon? Joy. Just before that, Mary, my question about that was that um, isn't, isn't the place, the trees, the flowers and everything just reflecting the soul condition of the people there? Yes. It's not really that they're different, just that it's reflecting who's living there? What do you mean it's not that they're different? Um, well, because a little bit further on, when um, he looks at the struggle that Marie's having, mm -hmm. like you can see that the trees and the flowers and the grass can go either way. And so they're just reflecting our soul condition just like... Yeah. And that's how the whole... It doesn't mean that those things aren't real though, does it? No. No, because that's how the whole spirit world is constructed, that it would be reflecting the condition yeah. of, of the people who inhabit that area. Mm. And, and everyone in that area would be, unless they're there like uh, Zena is, mm. to assist Marie, mm. that they're all in a similar condition, a similar space. So you're right, the yeah. environment is definitely yeah. reflecting their soul condition. Mm. Yeah. Now you asked a question about what happened next? Yes, what happened next? Um, is that when he... Well, he followed Kushner and it doesn't actually explain, I have another question about that, it doesn't explain the power uh, that allowed Kushner just to so confidently find the place he was looking for. I was yeah. going to ask a question about that. What was the question? Well, what, what was the power that enabled Kushner to find it so confidently? Okay, what, who, who can answer that question? Who has an idea about the answer to that question? So Kushan is going and he just knows the way to go, doesn't he? Yeah. So how does he know? Di? My feeling is um, that he feels Murray and so he, and he desires to go to Murray. Yep. Uh, so that's where he goes. Yep. I, yeah. yeah, that's my feeling too. Does anyone else have a different feeling? <coughs> it's also in his neighbourhood, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He's been there before. If you pass back to Glenda, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, he's been there many times before, yeah. so he knows the way, but he also found that place for her. He did. So he searched that place before. Yes, um, yeah. And what I love, this whole area is like little seclusions for specific people. And it's, why it's like a healing yes, why um, place, place for someone to recover, and there's lots of them. Yeah. What does it say? Does it, has anyone? Does it, can anyone remember exactly what it says about the the locations? If you pass forward to Karen, when I read it a few weeks ago, the the, the phrase that um, moved me a lot was um, at the same time a sure asylum to the weary and the hunted who stood in need of such a haven of refuge, um, and I guess I felt. My immediate feeling was like, do I have to wait till after I die till I <laughs> can have a haven of refuge? Um, but no, yeah. not at all. What do you have to wait for? What happened for Marie? I, I think the turning point for her was when she, when she cried out for help at the very, on the last page. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah and we'll, let's talk about that as we go on because there, there's so much in her journey, isn't there, for us to reflect on for ourselves. But I believe we don't have to wait um, till we get to the spirit world to have a haven, mm -hmm. but we have to reach a certain condition in our soul to be, to be open to that. Yeah, yeah. If you pass forward to Joy. Mary, I thought in some ways it was quite like what we're doing up here. We find our little spot in Wilkesdale or somewhere and a <laughs> life of solitude and <laughs> withdraw from the world and feel our wounds. <laughs> as long as that's what we're doing. Are we all doing that? <laughs> uh, something that struck me about this chapter is the journey that Marie went on emotionally, the, this, the place that she reached emotionally and it... It made me think long and deep and feel about have I been on such a journey? Because I know there's one ahead of me if I haven't been on that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a lot, isn't there, in, in this, this place where she is. And again, we're seeing, what are we seeing about the environment? How is it designed? Nina? Yeah. The thing that really moved me about the first part of this chapter was... 
the multitude of provisions provided for us to find our way home. It seemed like there was so much care in where she found herself. It wasn't just Kushner, it was her environment, her friend taking care of her. And even Fred's visit was obviously a part of her journey and I was I just thought wow you know that and not there was one paragraph that said you know not one single one of us was going to be lost yeah 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 that is very moving part of the chapter isn't it um he said but standing thus I solved a problem in spiritual mathematics as I saw the antithesis of life heaven and hell curved by the power of love until they touched, overlapped and blended to form a circle of divinity. In that illustration I grasped the stupendous assurance that it will be impossible for any single soul ultimately to resist that gravitation which operates in the higher life for the purpose of lifting up the fallen or rescuing the lost. And the words of Jesus, until he find them, came to me at that moment with a force and meaning I had never seen before. Did anyone reference the Bible, uh, where that came from? Yeah. Glenda, you had a hand up. Yeah. I don't know if this is the reference that they're talking about, but one thing that has been really, really meaningful for me, and I think one of the... uh, the biggest assurances for me on learning about divine love is reflecting on that parable that Jesus told in the first century about the shepherd and his lost sheep yeah. and he left the 99 that were safe and he went to find that one that was lost yeah. and it doesn't say how long he sought just until found yeah. there's yeah. no deadline there's no pressure there's no um None of these religious things like, you know, when Jesus comes again, you're either lost or found and that's it. You know, there's no... Um, yeah. And that's the biggest thing for me on this path. Yeah. So what's, what's it demonstrating? What does that parable demonstrate? It, it is here and I'll ask one of you to read it for me in a minute. But um, what's it demonstrating? This thing that... This God's feeling that you have. That yeah. It's... Um, it's that life is a term, that there is hope, that I'm not, um, that I'm worthy of someone searching for me until I'm found. But what was the first thing you just said to me? Hope. No, you said God's love. Oh, God's love. Yeah. Because yeah. really that's what, that's what Fred's seeing in action, isn't it, in the spirit world. He's seeing that everything in the environment is designed to, to bring a person back home to him. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Would anyone like to read the the verse? Yeah? It's Luke 15. No, 15. Yeah, there. (coughs) Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. That's it. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's very beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, and just to... Um, They're beautiful words, I suppose, that many people who've studied the Bible have read. But what I love about this chapter is that we're seeing it in this glistening kind of portrayal of what that actually means. Um, What it means to have a whole world and environment designed to, to bring us back to God. 
Who reflected on this in terms of their life right now? Yeah, any? What, what were your reflections? Who, who wants to share that? No one. No. Who felt like everything... Yeah, Do I? Um, it made... It did help me when I felt that this was God's love in action. Like, I could really, like, feel that and felt... Like, but this is happening for me. Like, why aren't I seeing it here, you know? Yeah. And so I opened my eyes a bit more and felt that and, and felt that, you know, God is there in the spirit world so I can accept that. Why can't I accept that God is here for me, you know, yeah. now? Mm-hmm. So that was good because I got, actually got to feel that I matter to God. Like, and that was a big thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Di. Anyone else reflect on Raj? Um, I just found it so humbling that, um, like, Krishna has got the time and the energy to devote to one person so much. And, and yet he's obviously a very powerful and respected elder in doing the ministry work. Mm-hmm. And I realise that my guys must feel somewhat the same. And I always think that there's so much more that they have to do. But really their focus is very much devoted to me and to each of us. Yeah. Similar to Mon, that feeling that, oh, don't they have better things to do or don't they have other things to do? Can you, what what do you see from the way that Krishna operates? Because he's not just with Marie all the time, is he? So what's, what's supporting him in his work with Marie? Oh, I think probably legions of of other people and other beings, angels, and God's love more than anything else. And, and how, how is that facilitated to occur? What has Kushner done himself for that to occur? Nina? It's like he has um, helpers that he can call upon to assist him in his work. Why is that? They're based on their desire to uplift others as well, I'm guessing. Yep. Yep. But why is it that Krishna has these people around him? Pierre? Did you have your hand up? Or was it Sandra? Sorry. Sandra. Yep. <laughs> oh, he's become at one with God. He's become at one with God. So does that mean that only when I'm at one with God will I be able mm. to call on these people? He's got a desire to, to serve and help others to also get to that level that he's at and further. Yep. And so what kind of desire is that? A pure one. <laughs> <laughs> and what's a pure desire? <laughs> love. It's based on love. On love, yeah. yeah. And specifically, what kind of love? For our brothers and sisters. Love. Yeah. Yep. Well, specifically, I think it's in harmony with God's love and desire, isn't it? And so that's what I see is really beautiful in this, this illustration, that Kushner ha- did this really personal work with Marie and then there's a whole environment that he's able to accommodate her in. There's other people who want to join in this effort to help her and he's not bound to her. It's not hard work all the time because he's acting in harmony with the fabric of the spirit world, the way it's created, isn't he? And, and anyone else with that similar desire for, God's, for God and for God's way of doing things is going to end up assisting him in some way. So even, did any of you consider how Fred helped in this situation? How did Fred assist? Someone else, if they got their hand up, yeah. Uh, if we go back to Lorleen, yeah. Um, it's a bit further back, but um, when she retells the story, um, she tells the story um, to him and that helps him to see things as well as herself. Yeah. So can you see that in that way, even Fred's desire, Fred's only in the second sphere at this point, uh, and, but Fred has a desire for God's way and a desire to know things. So in the end, he ends up helping, he learns, but he ends up helping Marie and Kushner in their effort, doesn't he? Yeah. Alan? Um, I'm just, I guess I get overwhelmed by his curiosity. He's got this enormous curiosity. Yeah. And he ha- it's almost like he's got this inbuilt safeguard that he knows if he goes to places that he's never been before, there's almost um, a conjunction of... Um, reward or benefit for him 
it's not just the service one way, it's the service in as well as out. Yeah, he mentions something like that, doesn't he? I can't remember if it's in this chapter or the next. He says he's developed a trust in just the way yeah. things happen here. Yeah. He knows if he keeps following his heart. Was it in this one, Di? Yeah. yeah. Do, um, yep. 106 of the printed book, yeah? No, five. Do you want to read it out, Deidre, if you've got it? Yep. Uh, but again, uh, sorry, but ag again I was impealed by the mysterious influence which operates to carry us over points of difficulty and uncertainty, always in the right direction, even though opposed to inclination understanding for the time being. Yeah, so he's got this trust, doesn't he, that things are going to work out. And there's another place there where he mentions something very similar, which it's perhaps in the next chapter, which I shouldn't jump ahead to, but um, where he says, there's just a way that things work here and I know if I keep going with them, I'm just going to keep learning. So how do you rate, relate this to your life? <laughs> what can it teach us, this, this, this quality that Alan just finds so compelling in Fred what what how does it relate to us does it relate to us or is he just in the spirit world and we're here and it's not really related <laughs> uh yep um Rochelle it's just having that constant desire for growth and learning no matter if we get knocked down or if the ego gets squashed or just that desire for truth and growth and love towards God <laughs> That's right. So he has that desire and that's, that's carrying him through things. But there's another element to it, isn't there, that he's developed, which is Karen? This is a bit of a question. Like th This quality of persistence, I've, I've wondered, is that what just some people have or has everybody got the quality of persistence? Because it seems that that's what impels some people on and others... No. Is it okay? So, how would we define persistence? What do you define as persistence? Well, just not just getting up every time you fall over and keeping on getting keeping up every on going. Time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just not really seeing an alternative, but to keep plodding forward in a way. Yeah. So, what would drive us to be in that state? There's a few things that would drive us to be in that state. Do you, do you want to pass to Renee? And I was just feeling the bigger, like a bigger picture, like a, a God, <laughs> like having a desire, yeah, strong, seeing what's possible, and yeah. So, and I also feel that it's the opposite to um, resistance. So, yeah, persist, persistence is not resistance. So, yeah. well, it's funny, isn't it? Because sometimes, have you ever noticed people in life who persist and persist and persist and they're never going to give up and it's not working but they're never going to give up and they work harder and they persist and <laughs> Karen's like, ah, me. <laughs> isn't that trying though? Well, this is what I'm trying to explore with you guys. What is, what's going on? What, what is persistence and what is... Yeah, yeah, if you on. have something greater to... to like it's, I'm not into goals, but it's something to have... So what's that it's quality like, you're like a, describing? Uh, like a, a desire, it comes back to desire. Like, I don't know, it's a feeling inside. I, I can't explain it. It's like a, a knowing. It's a certainty or a what knowing. What do you know? What, do you, what are you certain of? That things trust. It's a knowing that things work and that it's a feeling of... Um, what is that she's Harmony. Describing? It's like a harmony cross between us. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a word beginning with F. But it, does anyone else agree with me? Yeah. So I think that's faith that you're talking oh, about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not fear. No. Not the other F word we always talk about. <laughs> Phew. Let's change. <laughs> so faith can make us stay with something, can't it? Yeah. Okay, what's, what are some other things that make us stay with things? Yep, San, uh, Sandra? And, yeah. Humility. Like, if I try and try and try, I'm not humble. I feel like I have to be humble to what's going on for me to get a result if it's going to change. Like, 
Yeah. Is that something that drives us to keep doing things? Yeah. How does, how does humility what? fit into it? I'm not saying you're wrong. I just yeah. want to... Um, the drive has to be come from, well, like when I said desire. Um, yeah, but if I want something and I know I really want it and it's because not happening, it's like because I'm not being humble. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So that's that's more of an understanding of a law that you're relating right. there. Because if you're a person who just keeps going and keeps yeah. going and keeps going and just goes for the thing and works hard and works hard and they look grey and gaunt <laughs> and exhausted by the time they're 45, are, is this, are we looking at a humble person? No. 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 Yeah. What is happening for that person? Pierre? Um, when we are humble... Um Sorry, I'm just writing desire because we talked about that one. Yep. If we are really humble, we, we get we get to the cause and we, we can release the cause and feel God and feel the the peace what's after. So even if we fall and if we are humble, there will be a very beautiful place afterward that give um, trust. Uh, yeah, to keep on. So know, if, so if you're talking about someone with a desire and humility, which is what yeah. you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. You're saying that it would be a far more peaceful ride than the person who's going and mm. going and going. So I'm asking what is driving the person who's going and going and going? Yep, over here in the blue. If you pass back. No? no. Alan? <laughs> um, along with faith, I'd say there's a fair bit of courage going on. There's courage, yep. Yeah. But s people are still not answering my question about the exhausted person. Because I actually see that exhaustion person often lacks these issues. If we go to Sue's, yeah. Self-reliance. Self-reliance is yeah. often, yes. Yeah, I know about that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a girl who's tried hard at so many things without any humility. And yep. <laughs> it's been really hard work. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so someone in self-reliance can get caught up in this cycle of... I, and, and there's also often a lot of fear in that person and a lot of lack of self-worth that drives them to keep going, keep going, keep going, doesn't it? Because this is the thing that's going to give me worth. This is the thing that's going to help me avoid my feeling of lack. This is, the thi this is how I'm going to define myself. I, I have to define myself. I'm not letting God do it. I'm self-reliant. That's the dogged kind of persistence that we often see in people mm -hmm. and is that a quality we want is that a quality we have yes. <laughs> often <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so and it's not the quality that Alan sees in in Fred is it no no what do we see in Fred <coughs> uh, if you go behind you now Sue yes you yeah longing a longing yes he has a longing what else Oh, if we go to Glenda, who's got, yeah, Pierre, if you pass. If you keep the mic on your side and, yeah, there's two. So. The difference between the two states for me is like, let's say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. <laughs> yes. Just get worn out. Yes. Um, and the other side for me is trusting the process. Yeah. So I do it again and again because I trust that it works. Mm hmm even though I might not get all the way this time, um, there's encouragement that, you know, something happens, so I'll do it again. And it's trusting my instinct, which is, I suppose, my instinct is my trust in mm. guides or God or, yeah. And one's with God and one's without God. Definitely. Mm. So there's a, there's a God reliance, isn't there? Absolutely. And would you say we're seeing these things in Fred already? Yes. And... What do you think is really beautiful? As he continues to have experience after experience, what is happening for him? If Kel? <laughs> He's growing in his everything. All of these things are growing, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. He, he steps into the process. He gets there. Remember, he's, he's on, the, on the hill just through the mist and he goes, something's very different here. I don't understand anything, but I can trust... He already had this, this sense of, I'll trust because I can feel this person is loving. Mm -hmm. And that started him on this whole adventure, didn't it? And, and his curiosity, which is what Alan loves also. He's adventurous in that curiosity, isn't he? 
Yeah, he's, right. he's courageous yeah. with his curiosity, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, Gary? I don't know whether he was just on the hill, but um, at the start, excuse me, someone said, you don't have to be afraid here. Yeah. You know, and I think that he just sort of took a while to absorb that and, you know, being a very fearful person myself, it was sort of like, what would I do if I wasn't afraid and I totally trusted the process, you know, so, and he just got more evidence that that was true as he went along. You know, Absolutely. Was, he decided yeah. in that moment to trust that person mm. and and allowed himself to be himself and all of these things began to grow for him exponentially. We're only up to chapter nine and he's already like, how much has he learnt? In how long has he been there? Not very long. And he's learnt so much. It's taken us how many weeks to even get to this point in the book? <laughs> yeah. Joy? Um, he's grown so much that, like, in the beginning, he always had a million questions and he had to learn a lot about that. Whereas now in this chapter already, he's actually learning to just observe. And so he has trust and faith that knowing that it will all come to him. Yes. And he prefers to be in that quiet place of just observing what's happening and learning that way. Yes. Isn't that an interesting change for Fred in this chapter? If we pass back, all the way back yeah, to Julie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. He's also changing from his intellect to his heart, you know, his emotions. Yes. And yeah. that's, you know, because yeah. he says he's so intellectually dominant uh, at the beginning. But yeah. you can see this... Yeah. This opening of his heart area, his emotions. So yeah. that comes with all of those. Yeah. So what it's do we growth. see? We see a man who passes through the mists and he, he hears some new truth. He decides to trust and he, he allows his curiosity to lead him. And he starts out asking all these questions. He wants to know everything. And, and people keep lovingly giving him guidance and answers. And because he's trusting and open... All these things, faith, God, reliance, courage, they all grow in him, don't they? So how does that relate to us? <laughs> Susie, <laughs> where's the mic on that side? Oh, yeah, if you just pass it across here. It's almost like he and Marie are polar opposites in their life experience the choices that they made, how they crossed into the mists. And he's demonstrating one way of life. And she is, you know, she's showing the experience of what it's like if you can't embrace these things mm. and you fight and you're self-reliant. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to talk about her. Is there anything else you want to talk about on this point, though? There's lots of hands up. If we go to Deb and then <laughs> Barb and then ac back across. Yeah. What was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> A bit going on. <laughs> That's all right. What did you want? To, what did you want to? Uh, uh, well, I wanted to share, share but I also had something to. Oh, I know. It was um, the the trust issue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> st still a long way to learn to trust God's law of attraction. Mm -hmm. No matter how much I got walloped, you know. That yeah. I think that's the biggest thing for me: learning to trust that if I just if I'm just humble or or try to embrace this rather than fight it. Yeah. That's something. Something good might be behind it, you know. It's just that lifetime of fighting yeah. for everything, you know, rather than uh, trusting. Which is the self-reliant part of us, isn't it? I have to control, have I have to define, I have to know, I have to understand, I have to protect myself. Mm. Fighting for my rights as a child, you know, and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what, I, what I just want to share about... Um, Fred that I'm really that I'm just so touched with this like this so much like one man he, he he's he did really well in life that he you know day I don't know what day number he's up to in the spirit world maybe only less than a week I don't know or maybe yeah. a month but like he's already um he's already in service yeah. he's already he's got the depth of understanding and heart and the poetry you know the like his depth of the depth of his soul, his understanding already, even though he's learning, he's already got this he's got this depth within him that's I just think beyond most of us at this point in time or me, certainly you know, where we're so from his study the Bible or whatever it is, and like he's with these guys that are really these guys just aren't second sphere spirits helping him along a little bit. You know, these are Yeah, Deb, I don't know if you've noticed who you keep company with sometimes either. <laughs> 
can't be more humble to that too. <laughs> Yeah. I know we're in a priv- pretty privileged position, and yeah, I, I, I still still beyond me how 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 I end, ended here, you know. But I think it's finding the balance, hey Deb, between saying, "Oh, I'm crap, I'm nothing like Fred," because remember, humility is seeing ourselves as God sees us. There's a big desire in you that led you to know Jesus. You know, there's a big desire in you that led you to go, I'm going to face a lot of ostracism by the rest of society and go and listen to this guy who's talking about all this stuff because I really want to know God. That's a part of your soul, hey? Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's the a only thing that keeps me going, really. It's my desire. Yeah. 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 But I think we have to be careful also of thinking that Fred is somehow like, we'll never be like Fred mm. because oh. really, as we go on, we're going to learn more about Fred's mm. earth life. But... Mm. You're saying he's already in service mm. after a week or a month or however. It's only a short amount of time we can all feel that in the spirit world. But he was already in service when he was yeah. on earth. Yeah. And this is something that I've brought up with you guys often before in this group. Like, why are we waiting to be in service? Why are we waiting to ask big questions of ourselves? Because Fred asked really big questions of himself and he faced the ostracism of his family and his friends in order to have to stand up for what he decided he believed in. Now, a lot of us, even though we're sitting in this room, still avoid those situations. And Fred is only in the place that he's in in the spirit world because he made those choices. He'd already learnt those lessons while he was on earth. So each of us have that opportunity to learn those lessons while we're on earth. And he's done the amazing service of bringing us this book where we can observe everything that was gifted to him by stepping into this process. Not only while he was on earth, he obviously had a lot of these qualities, but also he he, grew exponentially as soon as he was given some information about love and truth. And this is sort of what I'm bringing up with you guys today is that you have a wealth of information about love and truth but it can only act on your soul if you act on it you know if you act on what you know otherwise it's just knowledge in your head but Fred is showing us through his example and as Julie Julian really rightly pointed out he started out all intellectual but he as he learnt more as he was lovingly given more information it started to enter his heart and he's, he begins to activate all these other qualities of God reliance and faith really quickly doesn't he so I suppose what I'm saying to you when I say how does this apply to your life is that you know where I'm asking myself where am I at with this process that Fred's in you know he's showing me that if I embrace a process loving gifts come to me Marie's showing me if I act in opposition to the process that I'm in and I fight it and I hold on to things that it's traumatic and very painful and I believe it's exactly the same for here for us here on earth you know, I believe God's laws govern both worlds. So that's, if I say I believe that, how much am I living that? That's, that's the question I ask myself, yeah. Jen? Oh, thanks. Um, one of the things that's been really helpful for me is um, the evidence of change. Because we were talking about how Fred has changed, and I think it's really important for me to look back over the years of having been on this path and see just what has changed because that does keep me going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And when I know a lot of you, when you read the book, you go, no, it's so much nicer there. Like they go to a whole other sphere and then you get all this, you know, everything's nicer around them and there's more evidence of change. And But the truth is if you have been sincerely engaged in this this path, You can look back over the last three years and say, how have I changed? And often we get caught up in, oh, I know what I've got left to change. (laughs) That's pretty tough, (laughs) you know. And and that's that that horrible thing where we get into that uh, state of like dogged persistence, which is actually the opposite of what God's trying to teach us. However, I will say one other thing, and that is... This is tough to rub it out, hey? AJ has this really seamless way of like chatting to you while he does this. (laughs) I'm feeling a bit amateur. Yeah. Remember before what I said about humility? What did I say it was? I 
I've been uh, writing some uh, study plans for the humility course. So, uh, what's humility that I just I just said it just before to Deb? Seeing yourself, Nina, as you can see. So, seeing yourself. So when Jennifer says it's really important to look at how we've changed, sees you, sees me, let's put that. <laughs> oh, no, you can't do that, sorry. <laughs> it doesn't grammatically work. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, when Jen, Jen, Jennifer says oh, it's important to look at how I've changed, I agree. That, that helps us have faith and continue. But there can also be an addiction in that, in in that I need to, I sort of feel like for me, there's a place where I reach where I trust God's process and that's about ha using the evidence of what's happened before. So the evidence of my change and the evidence of what I've seen around me and the, the growth, in, not just in myself, in other people, in, in God's creation, everything, I trust. And that helps also me to have faith in things for the future. The, the place to be careful of is where we get addicted to saying or we, we feel so terrible about how we are that, no, but I'm better than I was and I'm not as bad as all those other people. <laughs> you know, and, and even, if, even if it's true that we have grown, we need to be careful of just avoiding other feelings or, or wanting to feel like, wanting to avoid the, the damage that is inside of us, the addictions that are still inside of us. And when we see ourselves as God sees us, we're not afraid to look at those things because we don't judge ourselves for them. We don't get really harsh on ourselves about them. We just see them and recognise they're an error. And I think probably most, the biggest thing I see everyone struggling with, and maybe it's because I struggle with it so much myself, is the judgement that we have of ourselves and our error. And that to me is like the, one of... The biggest, what I've learnt recently is that is perhaps the biggest impediment to me dealing with my emotions, is the judgement that I have on myself of those emotions. I, I, I've been working through these processes of giving up some of the judgement and suddenly it's just coming out of me, these things that I like berated myself and felt I had to feel and the whole process, because it wasn't, it was a self-reliant process that I was engaged in trying to define myself, fix myself, all of those things, nothing would come out of me in that place. Yeah, I had to really begin to want this seeing myself as God sees me, which is actually a lot less harsh often than I see myself. Yeah, um, that helped. Anyway, let's get back to the book. <laughs> Barbara? Going back to Fred, one of the... Um, um the truth that he's seeing is that um, he's seeing that God's plan is perfect mm -hmm. in everything that he's now seeing. So he's totally trusting of it because he now sees it's perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Because he's opened himself to this whole process, hasn't he? Uh, he's, he's seeing everything through different eyes and he's seeing, he's seeing the way that things work together. Mm. Yeah. This might lead us on to the next thing. Um, I was left, quite, left undisturbed and witnessed a practical lesson in nursing and sympathy which awed me with its angelic tenderness and unrestrained devotion. Yeah. yeah. He was... Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah. So, so what do we see about Azena in this? What do, we, what do we see in her qualities? That part of what Barbara's just brought up. Deb? Uh, what I was uh, personally touched by with her and with um, Kushner is the word devotion and affection. Like it's genuine, yeah, yeah, personal love. You know, yes. it's not this um, detached love or anything like that. It's a real personal. They're quite connected, aren't they, mm. to each other and mm. to Marie? They're they're very and the realness of that and how we can, we can all have that. You know, yeah. just that. I don't know that somehow I had a you know we got these little missing pieces I didn't quite know that was in the spirit world to that extent 
you know? Yeah, yeah. The fondness for each the other. The fondness and yeah. the joking. They have the a joke with each other, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The teasing. Thank goodness I wouldn't want to go there if it wasn't just <laughs> down to earth. If we all had to be sombre and ethereal. Oh, <laughs> I think maybe a lot of people do uh, w- not want to go to the spirit world because there is like a, this conception that we'll all be like wonderful and personalityless, and you know there won't be any like jokes and yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so we see that Marie is is really connected uh, to Azina. Azina is really connected to Marie, isn't she? In terms of her her feelings and yep, joy. If we go fast forward. I don't know if we covered this, but it was important for me, was that um, one of the things that Kushner and Fred have in common is their real passion to see other people happy. Like Kushner lives, he gets his happiness from doing everything that he does in his whole life is for somebody else's happiness. Okay, does he get his happiness from other people's happiness? Well, no, he doesn't get it from them, but it makes him happy. And I question that does too. Does it make him happy? Hmm. I don't well, know, he what do you happy think? when. He was, he was happy knowing that things that he had done had caused other people's happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wondered about that too. It was kind of like it was right on the border of, well, does that mean he's living for them? And I don't think that it is. Mm-hmm. I just think that he's driven to... So what's the pure state? When we're happy and we do something for someone else... What, what happens? What's the pure thing that would happen if we're in harmony with love? Suzanne, yeah? It's almost like in, in the absolute giving and the selflessness and the desire for, to ha- want love for another person, it's almost like you touch God and that it just infuses everything and it just seems like it says here... Um, he sees additional happiness invariably resulting from his labours. He himself is quite happy, first in sympathy with those whom he has made so glad, and then again that he has been the means of such enjoyment. And it's just like, I think we experience that too in the moments when we're really loving and something really good is happening. There's just a flash of love that goes through everything and it's incredibly beautiful. Yeah, but I don't know if we touch God though. Oh, I, I mean, I mean, um, I think I did mean that. I d- mm. It's like that quality of God that infuses all of heaven, that inspires and fills everything. It's like you were saying before, who, why would Kushner attract all that help? And why would Azina be working with him? And it's almost like the perfection of God's love is touching everything. And in the moments of absolute selfness, selflessness, everybody's filled with the joy of that. That was my feeling about it anyway. Yeah, I suppose what I feel is that it's not really, it's not really a magic thing that happens in the spirit world when someone's working in harmony with God. It's not mystical or something. It's a real nuts and bolts way that everything works. And, and it, it happens when, like if I want to build a house and I have a pure desire about it, like if I want to build an orphanage or something <coughs> to give to all these kids who I can see living on the street. Now, because this desire of mine is pure, I'm going to get a lot of assistance from the spirit world in terms of celestial help. Mm-hmm. But also, if Barbara came along and Deb came along and Graham came along, um, they, if they had a similar desire in their heart, they would pick up tools and help me. It, it, it feels like it's not like a... They wouldn't be whimsically brought, brought to me by some unknown force. It would be because, be because of something that's really inside of them that would bring them to that place and, and motivate them. And so I think we have to be careful in saying that, oh, um, that you sort of touch God. I think I know what you're saying, but I want to make it more real, you Mm -hmm. know. When we act in harmony with God's desires, a lot of things work with us because that's how God's designed the universe. But I think this is different from when I'm in a loving space and I do something for Barbara and it brings more love or happiness to her life. That's not necessarily related to God. That can just be about natural love, can't it? Hmm, I guess, Mm. yeah. And if part of my soul's personality is a deep desire to serve others, um, 
and not from an addictive place but just because I desire that, when there's a fulfilment of that desire, I think I, my joy would be increased because it's an expression, I've had an expression of my personality. <coughs> but I don't really know. I mean, that's what I think. Yeah. Mm. Glenda? There's a paragraph here where Fred asks Azina, does this place seem dull and gloomy to you in comparison with your own home? Mm -hmm. Dull, she exclaimed, her face suffused with the brightness of her smile. No, anything but that. Heaven consists in condition more than locality. And to have a share in driving the clouds from poor Marie's life is quite sufficient to turn any place into a heaven. Mm -hmm. So she's actually demonstrating that very thing, isn't she? She's driven by a pure desire. She's already in a heavenly kind of a state. And this, this feeling within her of a desire to serve others is actually bringing her joy as she, as she enacts it. Yeah, yeah. Karen? <laughs> I, I think... Um like you were pointing out before that my happiness is not dependent on making other people happy. I think too that you know my happiness has as a byproduct my making other people happy. Like if I'm in a in a bad place and I try and make people happy, like that's such a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. If I'm in a good place, it's almost an automatic thing that yeah. um, I want to do things because I'm already happy. Yeah. yeah so. Well, yeah, I'm already happy, so whatever comes from me is actually less needy and more desire-based, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And, the, I mean, I feel there's a very important truth of the universe, and that is when we are in complete expression, in pure expression of the soul that God created, we're automatically in service. Mm. That's the way he designed it, which is a really cool design, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Renee? And then we go to Nina. And I feel it can be as simple as it just opens you up and 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 you come back into your heart more on a giving if it's unconditional. If you're giving unconditional, it can just open you up if it's in the area that you love. Well to if give. you're giving if you're yeah, giving without any purity of without any out any strings attached, your heart is open, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's it's already open. Yeah. To do the joyful place. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're sad. Yeah. <laughs> Nina. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, in part of the chapter it said that Kushner requested permission to take Maria. And I was a little bit curious as to what laws were at play that he had to ask permission. Where does it say that in the beginning? <laughs> he saw you. The words are he sought permission to bring her back to his to place. To bring her back to his home. Okay. So... I want to go to AJ now, if he's willing, to, to, to ask you about the, um, the joy stuff that we just talked about. And would you mind, would you mind, babe? You okay? And, yeah. Thanks, Lomi. So what, what did you want to ask me? Well, I want to ask about Nina's question, but firstly about the, you know, we're talking about the joy and the joy... Um, the feeling about um, Kushner receiving joy from serving others mm -hmm. and, and Suze's feeling that it connects you with God. Uh, my feeling is that, you heard, did you hear what I said about that? Yeah. Would you mind speaking to that a little? Yeah, I feel it does connect you with God to a degree. Um, but I feel it's more about connecting to your own desires that connects you with God. Like, mm -hmm. So God designed you with specific desires and and longings inside of your soul that are a part of your personality and if you engage those particular desires and longings you will always receive joy even if there is no response from an audience yes. so so even if uh, there wasn't you know the person she was helping she would still feel that joy yes and if Kushner had nobody to help he would still feel that joy but obviously his joy is enhanced when he can express this desire and fulfil his own desire through its expression and then also see others respond in joy to that desire or, or respond yeah. in, in some positive manner to that desire. Yeah. So I feel a lot of it is about understanding that actually once we embrace our pure nature and desire, 
we will be doing things we automatically desire to do. And because we're doing what we desire to do, we're actually getting closer to ourselves. We're getting closer to how God designed us to be. And as a result of that, we are going to be happier even if there is no response. But, but if there is a response, and the reality is there will be more of a response when we do that, mm-hmm. uh, we'll, our joy will be further enhanced. Yes. So, hmm. Thanks, babe. Mm. I'm putting you on the spot because you're the sound guy today. Sure, yeah. <laughs> the other question that Nina had was about um, Kushner seeking position, uh, permission to bring Marie to his home. Yes, and that, and that is, a, is something to do with free will. Yeah. Like she has the free will to, not, to choose to not go. And, uh, and you know, so he, his, he, he does need to seek position, her, her approval to help her. So the reality is when you try to force help upon a person, Mm -hmm. which many people here still try to do Mm -hmm. quite regularly, Mm -hmm. um, you are actually not honouring free will and therefore damaging the soul of the person and your own soul actually further. Um, Often when when we have knowledge inside of ourselves that we believe to be true, we have this also this feeling that everybody should know it and instead of respecting their desire to know it, we feel that we can force upon them uh, the information that we're giving. Yep. The reality is that if we are in a place of love, we would never force upon another the, the, the truth that we feel we have discovered. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We yeah. would always ask for their permission. Yeah, mm. yeah, thanks. So it was actually her own permission that he was seeking. Yeah. <laughs> Which is which is interesting, isn't it? Because as you read it, you may be thinking, whose permission would he seek? But it's the most natural thing in the world that he would seek her permission, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, who had the hand up? Kelly? Yeah. I'm not sure where it is, but um, it does say where he was there helping Marie a lot and um, he just was there all the time and it was... Um, he, um, he gained her trust. She mm-hmm. could see that, that he, he just kept coming back and, yep. and, and that he, she could feel that and that's yep. what opened her in to, the beginning oh, yeah, to yeah. keep trusting the process yeah. and go the other way. Yeah. I'd love to talk about Marie's story now and what you understood from it and what you felt yeah. about it because that, that's the, the second half of the, or the big bulk of the chapter. So who related to the story of Marie? <laughs> Lots of us, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, yeah, if we go to Karen and Barbara. The question I had about her story was that, um, was that 20 years of suffering, was that law of compensation suffering? So there was... Um, yeah, you're nodding. So yeah, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm receiving your question and oh, I'm I just letting you finish before I say something else. Say something else. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, I want to ask you guys a question. What happened with Marie? What, who, can te- who can tell me the story or maybe between all of you, you can tell me the story of what happened to Marie after she passed? Where did she go? What happened and why did it happen? Barbara, you're holding the mic, so I'm looking at you. But you know, pass it to Luli if you want. <laughs> um, I'll have a go. Yeah. Um, well, I think she went to hell, right? When, initially when she passed and she was in the cold, dark place by herself. Yes. For a period of time. Um, well, actually, I have some questions about that as well. Yep, um, what were the questions? But, so she was describing how she got really, really cold and like mm-hmm. even her brain and her heart and everything. And then she described how like this rage poured through her. So there was something going, like she w- went through this rageful period. Yes. Where she was in agony, mm-hmm. um, physical agony. And then that kind of passed. Yep. And then suddenly she was drawn to Charlie in the, in the I think he was in the physical world still, right? Yes. Um, and then she had to endure the jealousy again that, you know, she'd been wanting to avoid the whole time that she was on earth. Yes. And then she had to experience that after she experienced the rage yep. and the loneliness. Um, and then um, 
Well, then, after a while of, of being able to see him but nothing else, then she gets so desperate and prays to God. Mm -hmm. And that's when relief comes. Mm -hmm. But I, my question was, um, there's a point where, um, before she tells the story, they said that, that uh, Krishna couldn't help her because of the evil spirits yes. who were affecting her yeah. in, when she was in hell. Was that right? Or was that when she was only on earth? I, well, what do you guys think? Where were the evil spirits affecting her? Well, I, oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead, Lily. You can answer your own question. <laughs> uh, on earth. But then I got the impression that, well, they said she'd already paid her dues in hell, right? So she, she could have left. So something else was going on. So could she, well, this is inter there's a lot of questions, isn't there, about what really happened, isn't there? So let's rewind. She went to the cold, she had the fever, didn't she? And, or do you want to rewind right to the start of her story on earth? <laughs> where, where do we start the questions from? She, so she, she had this very, she was raised, wasn't she, as a very spoilt person, and she played with the hearts of men. And she had the interaction with her best friend who ended up marrying the man that she really loved, but she was too proud and too, um, I don't know the word, cruel, really, <laughs> to, to own up to. And then she was in this fit of rage until she broke them up. And then immediately that she broke them up, she obviously hadn't dealt with enough emotion. She, she fell into a fever and passed. So then she's in the cold, dark place. What does a cold, dark place indicate? Die, yeah. That she was in a lot of terror and it was actually reflecting her true soul condition that had in when we're on earth we can, um, you know, make up stories about. Yeah, avoid. <laughs> yeah, avoid. Through yeah. our life. Because yeah. she says that, doesn't she? That she avoided it. She used the wealth that was at her disposal to avoid a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. she likes... There's, she successful, well, successfully suppressed a whole lot, and you know, just created this and you know, bigger facade. Mm -hmm. It was like it was mm -hmm. great to like see how all that you know is happening and like see the threads for me. Yeah. Um, so she's en she ends up in this cold, dark place, which reflects her terror. I agree. Is if you pass back to Kelly, yeah. What, what were you going to ask a question or? Uh? Oh, it all relates, I suppose, somewhere. But no, I just thought um, when you were talking about um, where she, in her childhood and her wealth, she got everything that she wanted immediately. And when she didn't get what she wanted, that's what sparked the, you know, the whole vengeful, evil path that she took. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. And and so what do we see if you pass back to Samantha, what do we see reflected through her experience in the hells related to that soul condition? Um she appeared to be going through a lot of pain and then there seemed to be a point where she decided that she didn't want to feel that. It was almost like she could have kept surrendering or continue to feel that pain but she decided I, I don't want to feel this anymore I don't want to experience this anymore and almost just willed herself out of it and is it true in saying that she at that point went back to earth and that was when she saw Charlie like she is it do you know what I mean yeah it's I know what you're asking I, I want to see if you guys can answer the question yep Di <laughs> Diana's jumping out of her seat she was also alone, I feel, and this was a big thing that she um, had never had to face and was wanting to avoid all her life, yep. that fear of, of being alone. So you, you, you pointed out she's there, it's reflecting the fear that's in her soul and she's alone and that's something she's avoided all her life. So where do we, we know, where is she? In the hills. In the hills, okay. And then why is she experiencing this experience that she is if we go to Alan um, the feeling I got because I've done this to other people and I've still got a bit more repentance to go um, is she was very cold to other people and it wasn't just males mm -hmm. and 
Yeah. She was very detached, wasn't she, even from her friends' feelings and from very the church unloving. where she there volunteered, was, very detached, yep. And also that there was other things going on, which I can't read into it fully yet unless we hear about it in the next chapter, but I don't think it was just that she was spoilt, that she was a, a reaction to not getting love from her parents. I feel that there were spirits hooking in there with the parents and her and there was other things, an, another undercurrent going through there, but we don't know what that is. Or mm-hmm. well, I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, do, you think, do you think it's likely that there were spirits hooked into her on, in her earth life? Yep. Yes. Yeah, uh, I do. Why is, that, why is that obvious to you? Why do you think that? Well, they hook into me and my, <laughs> and my fa- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and my family members. So I, I, and with the help of you guys, I, yeah. am, I know that it's true. Yes, um, yeah. And I can, f- I somehow feel that that's what's going on. And when does it mainly happen? If you pass forward to Nina, yeah. <laughs> she was really angry. She was really angry. Yeah, and when do we get angry? When our addictions aren't met. Yeah, and when we spirits mainly interact with us via what things pass forward to them? <laughs> Not feeling our emotions. Yeah, when we're avoiding our emotions, which we mainly do through addiction and if we don't get our addictions met, we get angry, don't we? So it's very likely there were spirits involved with her on earth, I agree. So she, she passes over, yep, if we go to Joy. Oh. Um, I thought the whole episode from when she passed over is the law of compensation acting out to f- for her to feel the pain that she's caused to others. Yeah, okay. So we know. What are the two laws that operate after... What are the two laws... What are the laws that govern yeah. what happens after we pass? <coughs> the law of compensation law of and compensation. the law of um, repentance. Yes. And, and clearly she's not in a no. state of repentance, is she? So she's gone somewhere that's that is, show, is reflecting the pain to her of everything that's happened. And as Di points out, and Alan, I feel that both valid points, that she's a cold person in a lot of fear. And there she is, frozen and alone. Deb? I just don't want to forget that she didn't know she died. She yes. had no... Which yeah. is pretty scary, hey? Yeah. Well, if... And there's... What do you see about her process of passing? What, what strikes you about that, that she didn't know? And what else about the experience? Uh, if we go to Deirdre. Well, she didn't go through the mist that we can tell. Because so she, she wasn't conscious of passing through the mist? She wasn't conscious, conscious of passing through. Yeah. And um, I, I just, because I can relate a lot to her. Yeah. Um, that she had like a lot of um, like like with her because of what happened with Charlie I was like well she probably didn't get a lot of her dad's love because she just could buy everything like as they thought that well they'll buy her her affection so she probably had a lot of fear of us not being loved and alone so but when it comes to the compensation thing like she was kind of like in my almost fighting the law of compensation like because I was going to ask the same question like Luli had when Kushner said like this was was even her first rest period it was like others beforehand she had no recollection of it so mm-hmm. she was like even fighting the law of compensation I'm like how is that be I thought law of compensation once you felt it your causal emotion either went via that or went via repentance but so, if you're fighting your law of compensation here, why would it change when you go to the spirit world? Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I just that's all right. That's okay. If you pass back, if you pass back. I think because she was very wealthy... She knew how to make demands. And then when she went to the spirit world, she was still making demands. She's very demanding, wasn't she? Yeah. And and very fighting, as Deirdre says, the law of compensation. But just just on Deb's point, we notice that she, she doesn't realise she's passed. What is dominating her experience? If we go to Glenda, yep. Glenda, please. It says here, or she states, in my rebellion, 
God stood aside and let me gather all the necessities for a heaven of my own design. And when the work was finished, he bade me enter. Then, lo, I found my heaven to be God's exquisite and perfect hell. Yeah. Now, later on, she actually prays for hell because she thinks hell would be better than where she is, obviously not realising that that's where she is. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, the point I, I'm raising is, yes, she is in rebellion. She's resistive and she doesn't know she's passed and emotion is dominating her experience in the spirit world, isn't it? It's not intellect. She's not there thinking, oh, I wonder where I am, you know. Oh, I wonder what's happening. Oh, this is different. Oh, I wish I could, you know, it, there's none of that going on, is there? It is a viscerally emotional experience. This is an important note for us and for anyone in the spirit world listening and, and to understand what our soul is really consisted of. Remember AJ spoken to you so many times about this issue of what happens when you pass. I'll just ask for a bright light, bright spirit and it'll be, you know, even if she had have heard the teachings of divine truth, she went to church, she heard stuff, did it make a difference? No. Because the, con the conditions of her own hell were created through her own soul. So that is an important point to note, is it not? Now let's get back to what is actually... Is questions? Yeah. Because I want to get back to what is actually happening for her during this process. We, we, it's not clear to all of us, where is she? Is she in the hells? Is she on earth? When's the law of compensation? When are the spirits there? So if we can answer these questions, that would be good. So, on that, Rochelle? I don't know if this is right, but it seems she is earthbound. It's only because, well, what I thought about that was she was drawn to Charlie. She was drawn to Charlie. Yeah. So, she gets there, she's very cold. She's in rebellion by her own admission. What happens then? She, Nina? She's still wanting to extract revenge rather than... That seems to be the primary... You know, like you use the word visceral emotion, that seems to be the main thing that's driving her purpose for existence at the moment is to somehow get even. Well, not yet. When she first passes through the mist, let's look at what, what happens. Page 115 in this book, it starts. She's freezing cold. And then... How I prayed for the fever and delirium to, to return to co and conquer the icy terror which crept so slowly and so agonisingly over me. And it was a vain prayer. And th so then she became this frozen block of solid flesh. And suddenly what happened? Jen? He's got the mic, Rochelle. If you just pass it across here. All of her emotions just go crazy. She says it's like a hundredfold that I might contemplate with horror the process of my own petrifaction. Yeah, and, and then the furies boiled in my blood, didn't they? And lashing it into angry foam by its excessive heat sent it into maddening cataracts through my veins to finish the exquisite suffering which I must needs lie still and bear. So she's frozen and fighting it. So naturally what's going to happen? What do we know about fear? Did It increases. Oh, sorry, if you don't, what? if you keep fighting it... And sort of uh, surrendering to it, it just increases. That's what seems to be going on. Yeah. If we fight fear, are we surrendering to it? No. 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 So she arrives in the hells, definitively in the hells in a state of fear. Now, is it likely that there are spirits involved in her fearful state? Yes. Yes. And I think she even makes some small reference to that. So in answer to Luli's question, I feel that spirits are involved in every step of this process, but most um, pronounced in her interaction with Charlie, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, so she's in a state of fear, which she's resisting. Yeah, you know, she's, it's getting more and more and more. Jen? And when you resist your fear, you get angry, 
And that was the blood boiling part. Exactly. <laughs> so the things that AJ talks about to us here on the board with the fear and the addictions and the anger, that all still applies after you pass. So when she resists all her fear, she goes into a blind fury. It's so, but what, what is the thing about her fury there? It's hurting her, isn't it? It's pain. It's pain and it's pain and it's pain. And, and what is all this emotion governed by which law that Joy pointed out earlier? The law of compensation. So this whole process is governed by the law of compensation. Then what happens after she gets in this furious, rageful, painful place, Pierre? At the end, um, she kind of lo uh, lost conscious, uh, consciousness of what happened. Yep. And she, I don't know, she fell asleep or whatever. She, she doesn't remember. And suddenly she awoke and, and she felt that the worst part of the pain and suffering was over. Yes. So, what do you think was going on there? Okay, Karen. She gone to numbness. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't believe so. Diana? Was she being attacked by other spirits? No, no. I don't believe so. Renee? Well, she actually cleared, like, she cleared a little bit of the emotion and then she I believe shifted so. a little bit and yes. had moved. So she, under the law of compensation, she had, she had resisted her fear, which was very evident in her body and her surroundings. She'd gone into this terrible, painful rage and she had experienced something of the law of compensation. So she found herself awake and alone and still frightened and still... But it, it was somehow better. Then what happened? Jennifer? I think that at that point she started longing for any kind of light. She did, yes. But, but it didn't come immediately, did it? She was just sitting there longing for it and she just felt so alone. Again, she's still fighting everything that's happening to her, isn't she? Then what happened? Pierre? She, she felt stronger and better and... Um, suddenly she saw a light at some point yes. and, and she started moving and she could not control what was happening and she started moving and moving and she was scared and, and she ended uh, next to Charlie. Next to Charlie, okay. What was happening in that interaction? If you go to Karen behind you. <laughs> Why did she go to Charlie? I'm, I'm not quite answering that because I'm really hung up on where does earthbound finish and spirit world begin? And was she in the spirit world or was she earthbound? Okay, and why this am I is hung what up I'm. About it? Yes, <laughs> no, but this is what I'm trying to answer through this process. Okay. Okay. So she's in hell, being governed by the law of compensation I up until she, this point. Yeah, I think okay. she was drawn to Charlie because of his desire to, for her. He yeah. was. Yes, she, he thought of her. He thought of her, and she was drawn to him. Why was she drawn to him? Mon? Um, because she still had a desire for him as well in her yes, soul. Yes, what was still in her soul? She wanted to be with him. What's underneath the fear? The, gr the, the causal emotion, isn't it? Had she dealt with that? Because she's acting under the law of compensation. She's just made a small shift in terms of the pain that she needs to feel, because remember she's operating under this slow and grinding law of God, which is going to eventually purify her soul, but she's really just in the infancy of that process right now. And Charlie thinks of her. And so she's drawn because this whole area is still in her soul, isn't it? Come on. And it seems like she's back to where she started with the, with the anger, the jealousy, the fury, and, and obviously she hasn't dealt with enough I guess that yeah she's she's, back. she's she's barely even touched this has she she's just worked through this uh, to soften back into a state of fear but because the causal emotion is still within her 
Like, all kinds of crazy stuff can happen on this scale, yeah? Which does, doesn't it? So she's there back with Charlie, and what's, what's it like for her? Yep, yeah, here. It's terrible. Um, at first, uh, she's really happy, and, yeah. and she, she feels, uh, yeah, I, I got him back. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and then something uh, strange happened, like, like um, Charlie is obviously not seeing um, her, yeah. and there is someone else in his life. Yeah. But she could not see, yeah. but she could hear. Yeah. And what was terrible from that moment is that um, she wanted to leave, but I suppose because of Charlie's emotion, she is it could just not Charlie's emotion and her emotion? Yeah. yeah, she had maybe there is God's love in that that she had, that was the best place for her to feel all the revenge and the anger and jealousy left in her soul, and she was stuck there. She could not leave, and she, yeah, she was. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you notice about her in this state now? You notice that obviously she hasn't dealt with very much because immediately she's back in the sense of rage and fury, isn't it? It's also obvious she still isn't aware that she's passed after all this yes, experience, yeah. isn't it? And why do you think she can only see Charlie and not his wife and child? Luli? <laughs> um, um, this is just going on something I heard AJ say a while ago about Earth actually being really black to spirits and... Attachment, spirit attachments only being able to see the person they're attached to because from the spirit's perspective, Earth's like hell, yeah. blackness. Well, yeah, I think that's partly the case, partly why it's the case. And because her emotions are so enthralled with Charlie, it's like she doesn't even want to know about the other people. She doesn't, she's still in a state of denial about this, the fact that she's passed. She wants to deny that they're there. But then all this stuff is happening. And she, you're right, she's completely engrossed with Charlie. And attached to him, yeah. And this is where I feel a lot of the spirit interaction starts happening because what is the, what is the unique position that she's in with Charlie in terms of their emotional condition? Deb? Addiction. Yep, so what's the... What's the can you be more specific? Uh, well, um, uh, addictive love. Yep. And possessive... I mean, so it's not they could really be soulmates love, is it? for all I know. I don't know otherwise. Could be what, sorry? They could be soulmates for all I know. I don't know otherwise. But um, Yeah, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that they are. They could be too, but that's not what I'm referring mm. to. Mm. What has he got to her? What is his heart condition towards her? Oh, he loved her. He did actually love her. Yeah, Probably I think he loved her. He yeah. And so there's still an openness in him towards her, isn't there? Mm. And what's inside of her towards him? Possessiveness. Lots of possessiveness and all kinds of emotions, mm. isn't there? Mm. This, mm. this jealousy feeling mm. that's come up for her. Mm. So why is that really interesting for other earthbound spirits, that unique relationship that they have? Karen? Well, they can use her and him to feel their rage and jealousy. Yeah, because he's open to her... They can then influence her, can't they, to project even more emotion at him. So this is where it becomes very, not very loving, because she actually, she's already got what kind of feelings towards Charlie and his wife? They're pretty dark, aren't they? They're murderous. And then there's other spirits coming along and trying to keep her in this state. And this is the state I feel that they're referring to that Kushner tried to help her out of for so long. She's bound in this very negative, unloving um, interaction where she's basically got the emotions of a murderess. And she's stuck there through... And there's a lot of spirits holding her in that state. Graham? Um, would you say that in the spirit world, like, as soon as she had that emotion where she wanted to kill him, she immediately went into a darker place. Yes. Is that like, like, here on Earth, you can have pretty dark emotions, but the effect can be severely delayed, you know, so that you can't connect the two together? Well, the, the truth is, when you have that dark emotion, it does affect your soul condition immediately. But you're right, we don't always see it externally. 
we can be sensitive to that and go, oh, I felt that. So, so is that um, the way it works in the spirit world, that um, if you have unloving desires and things, that bang, it hits you straight Immediately. away? Immediately. So it's in that sense, in it would be easier to see the cause and effect than it would be here on earth? Yeah. Yeah, in that sense, you can see it external to yourself. Although she didn't get, she didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's that's. In, can you see the parallel between us here on Earth and her? That we don't often want to see. We want to stay in denial, and so does she. And so, it's very obvious to us reading her story. Oh my gosh, can't you see what's happening? But she couldn't. Yeah, you'd think yeah. it'd be incredibly obvious that she's had that nasty thought, and she's turned all of a sudden gone bang into this really dark spot. Why didn't she go? Oh. Could I have caused that? Could my feeling have done that, <laughs> yes. caused that? But she didn't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but if you think about it, Asia and I were just doing an interview before this. How many times do we go, huh, the law of attraction brings us something. We go, gee, that person's an idiot. Like, you know, why did they do that to me? Oh, I just broke my windscreen. I can't believe that. How ridiculous, you know. And we never connected with the, the, the feeling that we were having at that moment, that maybe that had something to do with why that happened. So if you think about it, there's a sort of a parallel, isn't there? Like it's got to be so much harder for us. You know, like there, <laughs> the, the effect happens straight away and it's so obvious. She still didn't see it. So how much trouble are we going to have here on earth if we feel that way, you know? <laughs> but if you think about it, Graham, you hurt your thumb recently, didn't you? Yeah. And... Did you recognise that there was an emotion happening for you right then that caused this effect very quickly? Well, I tried to find it. Yeah. And, and funnily enough, I was um, singing and happy at the time. And I eventually sort of felt like maybe I was, that was an avoidance of feeling something else, that I was distracting myself. Yep. Because um, often there's a, there's a feeling of wanting to be out of your body, isn't there? So... There is yeah, for you. possibly. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I was yeah. certainly distracted, and from an intellectual perspective, I could say my happiness distracted me from paying the amount of attention <laughs> that I should have done. You know. But when we're truly happy, are we ever disconnected from what we're doing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. When we're really happy, we're very in our body and very connected to ourselves, everything around us, and the people around us. So, yeah. and including spirits around us. I so. guess if we're really in our passion then we're really connected to it, aren't we? We're grounded, yeah. yeah. So my suggestion is to, to use that, as I know you've been attempting to, but to not think that, um, that there's so little evidence here, because there is evidence here. There are effects immediately that we can see. AJ? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to take the opportunity to have a personal comment to you, actually, Graham, if I could. <laughs> but, um, but it's a part of this uh, discussion in that there is a lot of judgment inside of you going towards this woman. And one of the reasons why there is this judgment going towards her is because you're reading her account and then thinking that it's very, very obvious. But if you were personally embroiled in the emotion yourself, it would not be obvious to you. And it's interesting that Mary pointed out the injury. The reality is that you've been an accident waiting to happen ever since I've met you with regard to mechanical things because you go out of your body all the time when you're starting to interact with mechanical things. And, and this is what causes the potential for accidents for yourself. But you're so embroiled in the emotion in that moment that you can't see the potential accident about to occur. And, and in that way, you're exactly the same as her. Can you see? So, so a lot of the times what we're doing is we, we think that we would be different if we entered the spirit world. The reality is we won't be because your emotions will be your dominant thing that you're attempting to avoid. And, and you will be experiencing emotion after emotion after emotion, a lot of times one after the other so rapidly that you are so confused because these emotions will be dragging you to different places in the spirit world as you're feeling them. Imagine the confusion. Imagine you're here one moment, then the very next moment, because of an emotion, you're in USA. <laughs> and then then you, you just get used to the fact that you've just arrived in the USA and you've got no idea where you are, what's going on, <laughs> why it's happening, and then all of a sudden you feel another emotion and you're in Taiwan. 
And you imagine the confusion of that process going on, and, and this is the kind of confusion that many of these spirits are in. And to be frank with many of you, you're going to feel very confused when you hit the spirit world for exactly the same reasons, unless we address the emotions here. The beauty of addressing, we actually have it easier here, because the beauty of addressing an emotion here is you're not pulled from that place to this place to that place to this place. You, have, you can stay in your own room and feel a whole series of emotions without having to go anywhere and be totally confused about what is happening. Right? You may have a feeling of confusion, but it's not going to be mirrored in your environment. Whereas there, every single feeling and emotion you have will be completely mirrored in your environment. This is where many of you do not understand the benefits of dealing with emotions here. You believe still, many of you, that, that emotions are going to be much easier dealt with in the spirit world. And I can reassure you that they are not going to be. They are going to be much more difficult. And the reason why is because you're going to be pulled from location to location to location to location to location to location. You won't even have enough time to think about what's happening many of the times because you'll be pulled from one to another to another. And many of you believe that you, you, you'll be fine. And to be frank, many of you, unless you address these emotions here, you're going to find it very confusing in the spirit world. And all the knowledge about divine truth that you have in your head makes no difference to this process. Because unless it's in your heart, it hasn't changed your condition. And therefore, these emotions will drag you from place to place to place to place, all over the place in the spirit world. So you imagine going to the spirit world, you, you pass, you're not even really conscious that you've passed. You can still interact with any person on earth here that you really wish to. You still get feelings from them. You can't verbalise it. You might, now that you, you know, uh, have the knowledge you have, you might be aware of your passing. But, but you're still going to be pulled by all of the emotions that you have that are unhealed. And, and they will pull you anywhere from, for some of you, anywhere from the second sphere to the depth of hell. The different emotions that, some of, uh, that you have will pull you anywhere in between those places the instant you start feeling them. You imagine that. You know, it's a much safer to be able to sit in your own room at home and try to connect with some emotions and, and not have to fly everywhere in the process. And, and this is why, like, I feel that many people on earth have no understanding yet of how much of a blessing it is to not only receive the truth on earth, but to actually engage the emotional process of addressing the unloving condition. Because once you're into the spirit world with that unloving condition, it is much more difficult, not easier, more difficult to actually address the emotional condition. That's why I spent the first half of this session encouraging you to learn from Fred and engage a process with humility because when you do, it's much smoother. Remember in the chapter on the magnetic corral, thanks baby, on the chapter on the magnetic corral, um, we talked about the mercy that is here on earth. That's exactly what AJ is talking about right now, is the, the fact that we have the opportunity now to deal with things without there being these incredible like law of compensation effects upon us immediately. Um, so rather than getting afraid about it, I hope that you can become inspired about the fact that this is an awesome opportunity that's, that's presented to you to have this knowledge, but the challenge is to, to bring it to your heart and to, to let it change your life. Because uh, as AJ says, if it doesn't, We'll be having experiences much like Marie. Yeah. If we, did you have a question, Karen? No. Pass back to Lorleen. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the um, being pulled into someone else's space, and it was um, there's many, but one of the questions is if I commiserate with a particular belief mm -hmm. um, that my spirit sisters may have. I'm actually um, drawing them into me, aren't I? Like, you, you don't, because Charlie had a thought and had an affection and opening towards Marie, he pulled her into her. Uh, she was pulled to him, right? Yes. So that's is that what 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 happens when you when you have that spirit attraction, which uh, you know, like I like. 
we so easily blame the spirits for influencing and attacking us. But if it's a commiseration, even in a belief, you know, like even a belief, let alone other things, acts and expressions, yep. um, that that's all part of... The that. law of rapport and attraction that yeah. occurs between spirit spirits and ourselves on earth, yes. Okay. So if I... If you think about it, um, there's lots of ways that this sort of becomes evident, isn't it? When people... Um, so firstly, if we, if we learn from the experience of Charlie and Marie, he still had an opening and unresolved emotions with her and certain feelings, a wistfulness is the sort of feeling that he had for her, I feel. And obviously he hadn't dealt with either the grief or the, the reasons why he would be immoral, really, in his relationship with her in terms of marrying someone he didn't love and then leaving that person to be with her. So there was unresolved things for him. And we know there's a lot of unresolved things for her as well. And that creates an opening. But as you say, even a belief system creates a rapport between spirits and people. And very often you see people who begin to embrace a certain a lifestyle or belief system who begin to start to take on very similar ways of their emotional state actually starts to become very similar to other people in that group and they dress the same and they speak the same and they look. And often this is about spirit influence as well. Spirits who are invested in maintaining a group in a certain way, who have a certain emotional set, actually become being attracted to people as they open themselves up to. And that can be uh, belief systems in harmony with love or in disharmony with love, obviously. Yeah. Mm. Okay, if we come forward to Renee. Oh, look, uh, if we go to Luli while it's being passed. Yeah. Um, it's just a question about spirit world and the difference between locations. Yes, this one. Yes. Okay, um, it's just a question about the spirit world and whizzing between locations. Does that go all the way on, up the whole way? So you're always like just whizzing from one location to the next, depending on how you feel. <laughs> Sounds pretty hectic. <laughs> but in a way, it's kind of designed to help you have knowledge of what's happening for you and also to grow through that experience. So it also works as you get higher up in the spheres. If you really want to deal with a certain emotion or deal with something unresolved in your past, you go to a place where it reflects that. Or if you become embroiled in those emotions from the past, you go to that place until you work through it and then you leave that place. So it doesn't always have to be like a, a whizzy thing once, once you are more, as I said earlier, humble and engaged in the process because then you're desiring to go different places, you're desiring to have this change. But it's still totally governed by your soul. Yeah. If we, yeah. Yeah, m maybe if I could explain a bit more detail. Um, remember, it's the emotions she's denying that cause her to go from place to place to place to place, not the emotions she's experiencing. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. But, but it's very confusing because you're denying emotion, you're denying another emotion, you're denying another emotion, and everything is going place to place to place to place to place, and, and, and what everything you deny is having an effect on where you are, what you're doing at the time. And, and the same applies all the way through the spirit world. Anything you deny, you will be drawn to a location that causes that experience. So, so let's say you're in the third dimension, and all of a sudden you deny some anger, you'll be in the hells immediately. Bang. Right? Now, the difference is, in the third sphere, you're much more conscious of what's going on because you've learnt a lot. Uh, you've actually know the emotional experience of going there and you've probably been there before. And, and so you know, oh, this is all about something and you can at least start allowing yourself to work through it. When you allow yourself to work through it, you go back to your normal home and you work your way through it. But, it's, but every time you deny something, you, you're going to be drawn to the place that, where that matches that denial. Yeah. So that's why... Oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, that's why Fred hasn't flipped from... Because he's, he's been fairly, you know... He's been like just a flowing of going from one thing to the next, desire, desire, growth, you know. You think about Fred's life on earth, though, Lily. He had very little ad addiction in his life on earth. He had a life, eventually, a life of service. Remember, he had a life, and you may learn this later, but he had a life 
uh, where he did have some turmoil on earth and he went through some pretty dark emotions and he was helped out through those emotions and and then he decided to live a life in harmony with his desires and and in harmony with the desire to serve right he 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 lived very emotionally while he was on earth he spent a lot of his time working with people he 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 stopped this attraction to family he did he had no family on earth he 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 had dealt with a lot of that emotion so the reality is when you see fred you're examining a man who is very different to what the average person is when they pass. Here's a man who's ready to pass almost into the second sphere at the time of his arrival. And this is very unusual. When I say very unusual, like there's only a few thousand people per annum who pass into this state. Like, so you're talking a very unique type of experience in comparison to the average experience. The average experience is more like the the lady that we're reading about today that that's the average experience where a person is in denial of so much emotion getting pulled placed all over the place in a lot of confusion and many of them have no consciousness in the first seven to ten years of their arrival in the spirit world even they are so tuned out and zoned out and in denial they've got no idea where they are they're completely in darkness and it's only after then that they be draw back to earth and then become earth bound because of the draw of themselves really it's all to do with themselves and their own emotion so you can't um this is where i feel many of you still don't understand completely the the effect of um having these emotions by the time you pass and many many do not get um and, and are not even honest about the emotions they have, you know. So, so many of you ladies here, for example, there's huge amounts of rage in you towards men. Do you think you're going to pass into a happy place with this rage, right? While you justify this rage, while you project it outwards at your guys, while you want control of men, do, do you think you're going to arrive in a happy place? No. And you're going to have a lot of rage and a lot of fear uh, you're going to be drawn from one location to the other location. Every time you think of a man who's hurt you, you're going to be drawn to them. You're going to want to hurt them. Every time you want to hurt them, you'll experience more pain inside of yourself. Now, these are real emotions that will draw you from... And you can know all you want intellectually about the divine truth, but unless you start realising that it's all about this emotional work, this change that has to occur in your soul with love, you're going to find you'll know everything and realise when you arrived that you knew nothing. Right? It was just an intellectual, it was just like reading a book and throwing it away. And if you make the truth like that, then the, the results are going to be quite amazing when you pass. We've, we've had many friends who we've had come uh, to us, who you have known personally, who have come to us in a, in a rage after they've passed, because these are people who you've known who have passed. They've come to us in a rage because they believe that everything that we said about spirit world wasn't true. And then when we started talking through them, to them, they start seeing that everything we said was actually true. They just didn't understand it. They, they thought they understood it, but they don't understand how their emotion was drawing them. And, you know, ones, ones who we then have spoken to again in the spirit world and then they've started to understand the correlation... But, but it's been, some of, them were, some of them were in a rage towards us for two years after they passed. People who we knew passed two or three years ago, they were in a rage for two or three years. They, they, they tried to make their families attack us because of their rage. That's how much in a rage they were, not understanding why. Right? And yet when they passed on earth, they believed that they loved us. Right? And this is where what you believe and what is actually the truth, very different. Belief lives in your soul, not in your head. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Just tag team back. Okay. Okay. It's nearly time to finish. Renee, do you have a question? or? Yeah, yeah. it was just about um, with Marie and Charlie... Oh, that they had similar injury or sympathetic injury going on. But was Marie, to me, I got a sense that she was really overcloaking him. That was what I felt. Is that something 
somewhere along the way it was the heaviness and the darkness. It just felt like quite a bit of overcloaking, even though he had a, an emotion in him. Yeah, I don't know that she, she was overcloaking as much as attacking him. So attached to him in, in an attacking way, rather than overcloaking and directing his actions, she was more attacking him. That was my feeling, yeah. Yeah. If we just quickly go back to Karen's initial question, which was about the law of compensation. Is it clear now what, what was law of compensation pain and what was additional soul damage? So while she was in the hells, under the, in her initial cold and then her rage and fury and exhaustion and these things, this is all the law of compensation. Then when she's drawn back to the earth, so she wasn't earthbound before then, she had passed, but she's drawn back to the earth because this unresolved stuff was inside of her and then she actually engaged a process of damaging her soul further. That's not actually law of compensation, although she's accruing more law of compensation pain and sort of feeling more pain as that goes on. But she's actually now engaged in a different process again, which is actually more damaging. And this is also what AJ's saying, you know, when we pass, it's not necessarily the end of where our soul condition can be in terms of damaging ourselves and other people. Because we still have our own will, this beautiful gift that God's given us, we can then become engaged in further harming our condition. And I wanted to bring you guys to the point that, she, what was the point she finally reached? Because remember she prayed a lot of times for this to end and to get out of it and it just seemed it got more and more painful. What, what was the thing that happened for her right at the end of her story? Karen, yeah. She gave up and asked for help. Um, but, but can I ask? Did she ask for help? Oh. She, she asked she for said, help oh God, many times. Will get me out of here. To, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, what was the last? She said, "Hell, hell, in mercy, take pity on my condition. Open your gates and let me bathe my suffering." in your fiery lake. Hell, hell, I say in mercy, open and let me in. What does this indicate about her emotional condition? What has changed for her, Deidre? Now she's willing to surrender. Or yes. D- um, yeah, con- yeah. Now, is, this is actually the first point of surrender, isn't it? Yeah, I, I felt she, she asked for two prayers. One was answered, like she says, oh, what's happening to me? Let me know the truth or otherwise I'll die. And then, you know, the causal emotion of rejection and all that is shown to her. Well, it, um, or you know that interaction. I think we almost need another week on this chapter. Yeah, okay. Two or yeah. three, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> because we need to talk about really where what's happening for her right at this yeah, moment. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. She she says finally she wants truth. And what is what's inherent in her desire for hell? What does that mean? She thinks she's in. Um, Below hell, like she thinks <laughs> hell's a prettier place. <laughs> yeah, sort of. What yeah. What does it indicate, uh, Monique? We'll come back to you, Karen. I know you've got a question here. That uh, she she's willing to experience the pain. She wants to yes. go to hell, hell to feel it fully, to, f- to, to go into the fiery lake. Exactly. She's more willing now to feel pain. All of her other prayers were like, stop the pain, get me out of here, I don't like this. And then she finally went... I've had enough. I just please give me hell. Like and this is the moment I feel that Krishna could come in and help her. Yeah. So if we go back to Karen, you had a question, is that right? Well, it may turn out to be next week's question, but yeah. I've always had this sort of I don't know where exactly I got it from, but when you pass you become earthbound and once you just and, and in that earthbound state you can continue to degrade your soul. But once you choose to accept that you're dead and you choose to go to the spirit world, that's where you go to where your soul condition draws you and from there you continue to access, well, you start to access help and continue to improve. I don't know exactly why that's, that. There is some truth in what you're saying. It's not exactly the same for everyone. Right. But when you pass, you can pass through the mists it, what is the what is the essential ingredient in all of this? What what, what governs what happens when you die? 
who passed to Kelly, yep, and back to Alan. Humility. Humility. That is exactly right. So whether you want to feel or not governs a lot of what happens. So you're right, Karen. If you don't want to feel anything, then you can go, I'm not even going to die. I'm staying here and I'll just keep going on and doing what I'm doing. Some people actually pass through the mist and then like her, they're not very humble to the experience that they encounter and they can be drawn back to the earth and do more damage. There is a point though where, where you can reach where you decide to be more humble and then a whole other reality starts to unfold for you. Yeah, if we go back to Karen. Oh, sorry, Kelly, you had your hand up too. Then, then she would proceed, is it, into um, the justice, mercy area of what has happened to her or what was caused to her as a child. Then let's that would talk take about place. Let, Next week, let's talk about actually what is happening for her now that she's in this place that she's in and a bit more about her emotions, I think. But the justice is already happening that, that immediately that you die. Remember we talked about that in the Magnetic Chorale? Mercy is until the time we pass and then justice occurs in the spirit world. Yeah. If we need... We, I'm just conscious that we need to wrap up, yeah. When we come back to Earth, we're trying to avoid the justice. But doesn't, it doesn't work as well as we see in Marie's case, hey? Yeah. <laughs> if we go back to Kel to resolve it and then we'll come back to Karen. Yeah, I'm just sort of like... I feel compassionate towards her and the state she's in and the, the mess she's in. Even I mean, I know she's caused a lot of damage herself and keeps doing that, but... And it doesn't talk much about her childhood and what actually... You know, I'd like to talk about that next yeah. week because there's there's a big emphasis in you guys on her childhood and how this is like really important to what she did. But <laughs> I'd like to talk a few truths about that as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that next week. Just any last questions or comments on this this section that we have been discussing now. Okay, we're going to go a bit over time today. Does anyone have any problem with that? It, I, Lena and Igor and AJ, are you okay with that? Because you're the support team. All right. Okay, let's, let's start with Karen. Oh, yep. And then over here, who had the hand up? If we pass to Graham now, he can... Okay, Karen. I think this is going to have a very quick answer. But so, through, so, the, mists, the, so the mists are actually between earthbound and spirit world. You don't even get to the myths until you leave the earthbound place? If you do not, you can not pass through the mists after you pass yeah. and remain earthbound. Some people, and that, but some people pass through the mist and then return to the earth, okay. choosing to be earthbound. Thank you. Or, but it's not an intellectual choice, remember. It's, it's, a, it's based on this incredibly emotional experience that AJ was, was describing, yeah. Okay, who... Uh, Graham had your hand up, yeah. Um, I, I didn't get the same feeling from that little quote about um, her wanting to bathe her sufferings in the fiery lake of hell. It felt to me like she was just wanted so much out of what she was experiencing that she was just clutching at straws, you know, saying that a change was 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 as good as anything. You well, know? Yeah, she wanted an end to what was happening for her, definitely. But I feel that the pivotal difference is that she was saying, "I will go into the fires of hell. I will feel this." There was a change in her humility. But it's like, take me, tear me, or destroy me, drown my reason past all hope of restitution, or by one tornadic blast of torture, put an end to feeling and terminate this agony. And did she, did that end there? No. No. The place where it ended was when she pleaded to bathe in the sufferings. She, she went on and on and on, and it was only when she pleaded to bathe in the sufferings. Okay. AJ, you've got your hand up. That's that's what I feel. It was a point. 
It is literally, and if you think about it, sometimes I feel like this with my emotions. I'm fighting it and I'm fighting it and I don't want it and I don't, it's not fair that I have to have it and all of those things. And eventually when I get to the point where I've had my tantrum enough that, <laughs> you know, I'll just feel it, relief comes. I surrender to the feeling. I'm just pointing out something I'm yeah, I, I uh, noticed that was just happened yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to say, AJ? Um, not that badly, no. <laughs> <laughs> not to cause Dyer to be unloving to the rest of the group and the entire worldwide audience by walking in front of the camera. But um, the the import the important thing uh, I feel here is you're you're answering asking some questions, Karen, because because you don't understand one basic fact and that is that she has not yet reached the depth of her own hell. When she first passed, because of all these unresolved emotions and her draw back and forward, back and forward between the earth and her location in the spirit world, she had yet to, really, to, to actually accept her emotional hell, if you like. And it's only when a person gets to this point where they're ready to accept their emotional hell that they're actually in hell permanently. Do you understand? Before then, they will go between the earth, hell, they will go anywhere their, their emotions draw them, in fact. So, so that's, that's number one thing to understand. It's a very important thing to understand. You're, th you're thinking that she's, as soon as she passed, she was into hell. No, she was not in the depth of her own hell yet. Because she had all these unresolved emotions that she had she, to... Remember, she was fighting it. She, she was, was fighting, in rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things we stated overseas when we were travelling, and one thing I feel it needs to be stated here in this discussion, is that the law of compensation is a law that operates upon the resistive soul. The law of repentance is the law that operates upon the accepting soul. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's her soul in resistance... And we're still, in fact, in resistance uh, to repentance, even through all of this experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the reality is she was, she was now accepting the law of compensation by the time she said those things about wanting to bathe her soul in hell. So this is very important to understand that she's now accepting the law of compensation, which is a progress, which is progress compared to what she was doing before, which was total resistance to even that law. Yeah. And would you agree with my comments to Graham about that she worked herself to a point where she was resisting res and finally ready to... Yes, the, and that is the... If she had not done so, Graham, no spirit would have come and assisted her, to be honest. Mm. Because no, no person can be assisted without a spark of a desire being present within the person to be assisted. So, so the reality is there might be a hundred spirits standing around the person waiting for the person to get into that condition where they are ready to accept the full extent of their own condition. And when they're ready, now they can be assisted. And if you think about it, that's so pertinent for us here right now, isn't it? Like how much do we want to really come to a full recognition of what's inside of our soul? And if you think about any major progress you've made at all on this path or in life ever, it's usually when we've hit this point where we're finally willing to see something or experience this big emotion that something big shifts. And that's, that's that law in operation. Mm. Until then, we're fighting it. We're not a willing soul. We're a resistive soul. Mm. And, and many of us, I see, even now, we know all this truth, but we're still resisting this full clarity. We don't want all the light bulbs on in terms of what's really in t shining on what's inside of our soul. When we are, that's when the magic happens. That's the power. And AJ gave a beautiful talk about repentance and the law of repentance and forgiveness while we're away that really spoke to that 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 is that is the point where we begin to change really change mm. yeah yeah did you have more to say darling there's always a lot more to say <laughs> <laughs> please keep going no, no, I, I think we need to continue. yeah all right there's more people with their hands up so is that all right graham mm -hmm. 
Yep. Alan, you had your hand up. I'm sorry, I stole the mic from you. Um, Kelly answered it, but I do have another question. Um, in compassion for others, does that have a, a bearing on your soul condition or is it better to ha have compassion in terms of loving yourself before you love others? So just thought that was interesting. I just something came up then before, and bit of. So what? Is, what is compassion? Having empathy for others that maybe aren't in a better, as good as a situation as you, for example. Yeah. So a feeling for someone else, a feeling of love for someone yeah, else. Yeah. Is it the same as commiseration? Probably not. No. 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 And so. What's your question? Is it better to have a feeling, have compassion for others before ourself? Or? Well, yeah, in terms of um, having a pure desire for service. Yeah. Um, and you were try you, you're trying to get it yourself as well as share that view to others. Um, that on the natural love path, I was taught that you should love yourself before you go out and serve others, for example. Yes. I'm just wondering if there's a bit of a difference there in the, on the divine love path. <laughs> well, who, who wants to answer that question? L Luli, yeah. My hunch is that as you grow in compassion for yourself, you grow in compassion for other people. So it automatically happens at the same time. It happens at the same time. Well, I was interested in... Alan's saying this pure desire for service. Like, what is a pure desire for service? What drives that? <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that compassion for self is coupled with compassion for others. Um, a growth in love. Some people find it easier. A growth. You can't truly. You know, now. What's a pure desire for service? <laughs> because I, I, Deb, uh, driven we'll by love. So it's driven by love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So love for for God and for others. Yeah. And what doesn't it have? Selfishness. Yeah. So it doesn't have selfishness. What else? Oh, that's me done. Okay. Who else has got their hand up? Just pass. Yep, Joy. Um, addiction. Doesn't addiction. have addiction. And it doesn't have addiction. It's my not equal sign. I, I can't, it's a long time since I did. Yep. So there's no addiction either. I agree. All right. So on, on the natural love... <laughs> I'm making a meal of this. On the natural love path, Alan learnt that you, you should love yourself before you love others. What, what do you think about that? Joy? Well, God's order of love too is that he wants us to love ourselves before we love others. And so we would never be unloving to ourselves. Does God want us to love others? ourselves before we love others? Yes. Who says yes? Yes. Who says no? Okay, someone who says no, what do you say? Uh, if we go to, who's got their hand up? Yep, um, Rose. Pam. Um, doesn't God want us to love... Oh, I've lost you what I was going to say. Um, so the question is... Oh, love others as we love ourselves. So there's no difference. Yes. Is there a before and after? <coughs> no. No. Doesn't God want us to love everyone equally? Yes. Which includes us and other people. Mm. Yeah. So... If we know that a pure desire for service doesn't have addictions, doesn't have selfishness and doesn't have, can I add, sacrifice of love of self and it's driven by love of God and others, then I feel that's the real question about whether we're ready to serve. Are we ready to fulfil those things? Uh, something that doesn't sacrifice the love of ourselves but is driven by love of others and God and, and a desire to be to express our, our own personality through this service. And it's not selfish. It's not based in addiction. That would be my prerequisites for service. So the, the issue of compassion, I suppose, is related to love. But 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Glenda? I feel that um, God wants us or God wants me to work on my soul condition before I work on the soul condition of others. But that doesn't necessarily translate to love myself before I love and others. And what does it mean to work on the soul condition of others? Well, to feel, oh, well, to assist them in feeling their emotions. I need to feel my own emotions first. Yeah. And how could I assist you to feel your emotions? Well, by listening. As um, not Maria, the other as woman, and Fred. As Zena and Fred. Zena and Fred. They both just sat there and listened. They didn't really say anything. Mm-hmm. I want, to, I want to point out to you the area of addiction with helping people feel their emotions. This is where we have to be really careful. I agree with you that um, it would be very hypocritical to go and um, help someone feel their emotions if I myself am not feeling my emotions. But my question is, can I really help someone else feel my emotions? Feel their emotions? No. I don't think Fred helped her f- feel her emotions. He listened and he loved her. So it was assistance rather than helping her heal, or support well, he- rather than helping her heal. The process helped her heal, mm. but did Fred go into it with the idea that oh, he no. wanted to help her no. heal? What was his idea? He was gathering information. Yeah, and what was his feeling for, for her from the beginning of the... Love. Love and compassion, wasn't mm. it? So he was himself in love and compassion and through that process that helped her heal. Can you see that when we go into an interaction with the intent to help someone heal, it's very much based in an addiction? Like, do you think AJ and I get up in the morning and go, right, we're going to help all these people feel their emotions... No way, Jose. We're like, okay, how can I feel my emotions? (laughs) And what would I offer to other people? How could I serve other people? I want to love them. I want to give them truth because I can see that that's love. That's that's the basis of me, you know. Um, I, I want to live in my passions and demonstrate to you how that's really powerful and wonderful. And that, that that can be a gift, just me living in my passions. I, I don't think, now, how am I going to get Deb to feel that stuff with her dad? I, I've tr- Honestly, when I did those opening to God workshops, that's what I was doing. It's icky. It was addiction, a lot of it. <laughs> Some of it wasn't. Some of it was pure, okay? But a lot of it, I was driven to help people feel rather than recognising their soul condition is up to them. All I can do is be an example, be my passion, give truth and give love. That's how I'm actually going to serve. Yeah. AJ? I just wanted to get back to Alan's question too because I feel the answer to that's very important and that is if, if I love you as much as I love me, then I will do for you what I'm prepared to do for me. Mm-hmm. So at any point in time of my own progression, I'd be prepared to do for you what I'm prepared to do for me. That, that would be the most loving thing. The problem for many of us is we're not prepared to do for others what we're prepared to do for ourselves. In fact, we're prepared to do far less for others than we are prepared to do for ourselves. You think about it from a, from a monetary perspective, you think about it from a, from a food perspective, from a clothing perspective... Many of us are far more prepared to do for ourselves uh, than we are prepared to do for others. And this is a big imbalance in, in our life. So many of us are, f- are very ready to share truth with others from a loving perspective only if we look at it from the point of view of, am I going to do for them what I'm prepared to do for myself? And, and if you're prepared to listen to yourself and you want other people to listen to you, then surely you should be prepared to listen to others. If you, you know, these are, and this is a part of the ethics, I suppose you could say, of our own progression. Many of, many of us have become selfish in our progression. We have this underlying belief that we have to fix ourselves first before we can help others. The reality is that you fix yourself as 
-hmm. you're helping others and you cannot help others when you believe you have an idea that you can help them. Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I just said? <laughs> you cannot help another person while you believe that you can help the other person. The only person that can help the other person is themselves. And all you can do is inspire them to do that in some way. That's all you can do. And you're certainly not going to do it by attacking them or by pulling them down or denigrating them or telling them what they've got to work on. That, that's not going to be very inspiring. The way to be inspiring is to actually do the work yourself and then to offer your assistance wherever it is desired. There are many people who desire our assistance and yet we're not willing to offer it because we're not prepared to do for them what we are prepared to do for ourselves. And that's where we have a huge imbalance on the planet. And, and sometimes we use this sort of excuse, oh, I've got to fix myself first before I, can, before I can share the truth with others. And the reality is, no, you don't have to do that. In fact, I feel, babe, that you just have to be willing to be humble to who you are at any point. Like, if, yeah. we, if we were waiting for me to be in a good soul condition, we wouldn't be having this book group. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but I feel like there was a point where I worked through a lot of stuff around doing those workshops and I reached a point of humility where I went, and, you know, I'm still working on that, but that I went, well, I, I, it's not going to be perfect, <laughs> but I really want to do it and hopefully we'll all grow through that process. So mm. that it's really just having, would you say, the willingness to know where you're at as you go into it. Yeah, and the desire to be perfect before you help another is actually uh, an, arrogant an arrogant position. position. Yeah. You know, the way to help another is to, to demonstrate to a person the humility of helping another even when you're aware of your own problems and only helping the other when they want you to. Yeah. Not yes. when you think they should change. Many, many of us get in this trap of, oh, I want the world to change, so I'm going to force my assistance on the world. Well, that, does the world want that assistance? Yeah. You know, what, what's, this is the question we've got to ask ourselves. Now, Kushner at the beginning of this book group today asked for permission to assist a person. Mm -hmm. He didn't push it upon her. And in fact, the fact that he, if he had of, he would not have been able to assist her at all. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he was in a very humble state. But he also was in this state where he was willing to do for her what he was also prepared to do for himself. It, that was equal in his sight. He was prepared to, like, what would he do for himself if he wanted to find the perfect location to have a person like this recover? What, if, if it was him, he'd find, he would have found a place that was on the, you know, that was nice and private, where the person's able to scream and cry and, and have visitors occasionally and all those kind of things. So that's the location he found for her because, because he was prepared to do for her what he was prepared to do for himself. He did not force her to accept that place. He just was prepared to do it because of this equal feeling that he had inside of himself. And I feel those two things are very important to understand. If we are avoiding sharing truth with others... Mostly it's because of our lack of humility. Mm. That's the reality. Because we're, we're unwilling to be exposed in any way with regard to our own condition. And so we don't want to share the truth with others. And we we've also then go into this place of forcing the truth upon others, which is a very unloving thing to do. They, they don't, it doesn't need to be forced upon a person. The only time when, when there should be an interaction where you have to engage the interaction and, and actually exercise a will to engage it is when they are in your space. <laughs> that is the only time that you would engage, a lo and you'd still engage a loving interaction <laughs> because you'd be prepared to do for them what you're prepared to do for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Okay, hands. Uh, were you done, Glenda? Yep. Mon? I just had a question on what AJ just said about arrogance. Why is it? Because I believe I need to be perfect before I help another. And I know I have massive emotions about not loving others. But I don't understand how it's arrogant rather than just because not we're feeling not, ready. Or we're not willing to be humble to what the experience brings us. 
So we're not willing to be humble about our own imperfections. We want to appear perfect. Um. Most of us don't even want to be perfect. We just want to appear perfect before we help the other person, which is a lack of humility, isn't it? Is this okay that I'm answering this? Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, sometimes we're, we, can, we can be afraid of how we're going to be received and we don't want to feel that. So that's an arrogant position as well. Mm. If, if we're truly humble, then we would then we'd be willing to experience any emotion that was brought up through that and we'd be willing to present ourselves without facade. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara? Just on the point AJ said before, and we did touch on it at the beginning of the book about um, Krishna's desire to find a perfect place for um, Marie to heal in. I actually felt that it was his desire that created the place. Yes, that he didn't actually, yeah, his desire to have a place that was perfect for her, created the perfect place for her. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about the spirit world, I yeah. suppose. But he had to be specific if you think about it. He had to... Oh, yes. He had yeah. to really feel about what it would be for her and, that would be healing and beautiful. And how perfect was it that it was inside of his place? Yes. That she yes. could feel comfort in that as well. So yes. it was his desire to give her all of those things that created the place for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is pretty, um, uh, something I used to say in the opening to God workshops is that I feel like the most powerful force in the universe is our desire in harmony with love. You know, it can create so much and that happens in the spirit world palpably but I believe it happens here as well. It's just that very few of us bring our harmony into desire, in bring our desire into harmony with God's love that much because when that happens I feel that very powerful things happen very rapidly. The few yeah. times in my life where I've allowed that to happen, <laughs> and sadly there have only been a few times, but it's been instantaneous. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, it takes a lot of humility, doesn't it, to, to bring our desires into that level of harmony. Yeah. Okay, Julianne, and then we nearly need to finish, I think. Yeah. It was good that you just mentioned humility because I think Marie had an incredible humility to be talking about her life with such truth um, and honesty and openness. I mean, it was pretty confronting um, and very reflective, let me tell you. But I just love the truthfulness that she had come to, to just say, this is me, yeah. this is the era I lived yeah, and it was pretty. So we in your saw face. her in this very vulnerable. <laughs> she was open. talking about how the lack of humility that she had had, but it, she was but, actually but demonstrating a lot yeah. of that. So next week, why don't we talk about the more about the journey of Marie right from her childhood through her life, what caused her to to get into this state, and then what happened? What has what is happening for her now when we meet her in the book, where she is in the spirit world? Because you know, where is she in terms of her soul condition and what's really happening? So, if we can talk about those two things, and I'd love, as always, for you guys to reflect on how what we're learning relates to your life right now. Yeah, AJ, can we just get the mic to AJ? Thanks. Babe, I was just thinking if you could add to that this, yep. uh, because one of the things I feel in the audience is that many of the people in the audience feel they have compassion for Marie and her experience, right? Yeah. But the reality is you're not having compassion, you're having commiseration. Yes. <laughs> right? And there's a very big difference between compassion and commiseration. In addition, you also feel to a large extent that her experience is unfair because of her childhood. This there is, is a what feeling in many of you that her experience in the spirit world was unfair. And my <laughs> suggestion is to have a look next week as to why you believe her experience was unfair because the reality is nothing is unfair with God. So, so, so let's. So what's our homework? We're going to reflect upon the... Um, what did you say about... The this difference between, between compassion, commis compassion and commiseration. And commiseration. This is a favourite question of mine at the moment. Yeah. I'm going to ask AJ in an interview next week. So the difference... Oh, babe, I wish I had your handwriting. Try to be too neat. Sorry? <laughs> you try to be too neat. I don't between try to be neat. <laughs> compassion. Compassion and commiseration. 
And so I feel many of you are feeling commiseration for her experience rather yeah. than compassion, but you believe it to be compassion. All right? And in reality, um, you know, there is a huge difference between those two emotions. And really the second, the second part of the homework that I feel both of us would like you to reflect on is there's a feeling, oh, I had it and it's gone, about her childhood, that her childhood created her life. Yes. And I'd like you to, to reflect on that question. Did Marie's childhood create her life? See, see, you are actually now dealing into delving into issues of justice with regard to God. Would God have allowed her to go through all of these experiences in the spirit world if Marie had no control over the emotions that were within her? Many of you still believe that you don't have much control over the emotions that are in you and it's all the fault of your childhood that these emotions exist. And this is not the case at all. And what I'm asking you to do is consider what the alternative might be. Whether the emotions were actually created by the childhood or were the emotions, her, her condition created by her avoidance of the emotions of her childhood. And the avoidance is a choice. And I feel many of you are not seeing the choices she made in her life that caused her condition of the soul to degrade. And you're blaming her condition on her childhood instead of seeing that her condition is related to the choices the unloving choices she made through her life and th th this is very don't, something don't very answer the to see. don't answer the question babe before no, we get but, there but yeah. i'm just putting forward the idea for yeah. you to ponder about and 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 see the difference between and yeah, and the final thing is, how does Marie's story re parallel or relate to your own experiences or life? Because I believe many who think they're on the divine love path are still justifying their unloving behaviour right now as the creation of something that happened in their childhood rather than seeing it as the de desire to make a choice that's unloving. And this is something that we need to reflect upon. Definitely. Mm. And Renee, you're I've just doing it right now. <laughs> yeah. You're doing it right now, making an, an unloving choice. You didn't put your hand up, you yelled it out. You instant unloving choice right there. And, and this is uh, without any consideration of it. And this is uh, an example, I suppose you could say, of, you know, we justify these choices to ourselves without any consideration of what's really going on. To be frank, if, if many of you sat with me in it for a day, you wouldn't cope with the whole experience. Uh, if you, you, many of you would come with a, what you believe is an open heart, but if you sat with me for a day like Mary's had to do for many months now, or many years now, you wouldn't even cope with the experience for a few moments because you, all of these unloving choices would be exposed very, very rapidly in, in your interaction. And, and, and this is what I'm asking you to do for yourself. It's, you, don't, you don't need to have somebody else with you all day to see your own unloving choices. Yeah. So this is something that I feel, if you could reflect upon what could have been different for Marie what could have been different if she had done something different? Like, like see, see, she could have had a terrible childhood like she had, and it wasn't such a bad childhood in comparison to many others on the planet, right? And, but she could have had the same childhood but reacted completely differently. So you, you need to ask yourself, how could she have done that? And, and that's, that's why the third question is to then think about your own life and your own relationship to the emotions in your childhood and, and how you're relating to them now, how you're using them to justify things in your life right now. Now that you have this knowledge about the soul and, and soul damage, how, how are you using that knowledge? Because we see many people justifying their current behaviour as saying, oh, it's because I've got this injury from my childhood. 
and and to be frank with you, your unloving behaviour has nothing to do with the injuries from your childhood. So sit with that question because I feel that you know this this idea of did Marie's childhood create her life, and what could have been different, and what cho- different choices she could have made, and. If you really sit with that question, let it bring up the emotions that it brings up. Yeah. Because it should cause you to question some things that you've learnt about the divine love path and the way you're living your life. Um, and does it feel just to you? Like, yeah. if, if that was true, if, if, it, if she had had this childhood experience which, was, which caused her to believe she you know, could expect and demand whatever she wanted, then, then would there be any justice in her experience after she passed? Surely God should have just said, oh, you, you know, you had a bad childhood, so I'll wipe all that away from you and we'll start afresh. If, if God was fair, God would do that, wouldn't he? So there's got to be some... If God is always fair and just, then there's got to be something else happening. And I feel this is really good questions to, to bring up to deepen your feelings about the path and understanding. Remember when we had the magnetic corral, how long it took us to get through that chapter, three or four weeks, because there was a lot of these themes also in that chapter about, you know, what happens when we pass? How is the damage taken away from us? What damage is taken away from us? Uh, What's the difference between mercy and justice? What really happens? All of those things... It became quite emotive for a lot of us because these are really emotive topics. <laughs> but they they go to once we once we understand these in our heart, we understand a lot about the nature of God and the way things work. When we have a surface level or intellectual understanding of the path, we go, "Yep, soul damaged parents." Da, 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 and we can skip over big things that bring up a lot of emotion for us about justice and what's fair and what's not and what we should be able to get away with. So. I, I invite you to take the week to to get really head up and feel about what it all brings up for you. <laughs> yeah. Because it's a process that I've had to go through myself, you know. Yeah. 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 Thanks, babe, for your input today. My pleasure. Yeah. yeah. yeah thanks for letting me. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to add anything else? Or? No, no, I think... <laughs> yeah. I, I just feel that the beauty of going through the book like you're doing is that you're having to have some... And I feel now as a group you're starting to get more deeply reflective. You remember at the beginning you were... In a lot of ways you were just sort of rehashing teachings you'd intellectually learned without giving it much emotional consideration. Now what I feel is happening as a group is that you're now starting to give things more emotional consideration of how... and reflection on on your own life and... That's the beauty of doing this kind of a process where you're examining the life experience of a person under the microscope, basically. And Frederick allowed you to do that through this, through these books. And it's such a lovely thing. And hopefully Mary will channel him for you, uh, uh, well, p- perhaps a few times before the end of these <laughs> books because he, he he's wants to talk to you as a group quite frequently. Um, and Mary does get occasionally to talk to him privately, but... The uh, the it's really wonderful to be able to have that experience where you can put something under the microscope and then reflect on it personally. And in the end, I feel, get to the point where you drive your own desire for progression. And and really, in the end, that the other, you're the only person that can. You, you know, n- nobody else can really help you as much without you having an openness to being assisted in, in some way and, and a desire to know. And then, of course, you begin to have an experience like Fred's where all this assistance comes to you, yeah. but it, it is requisite, like the prerequisite is that you have this, this feeling in your heart that you really want to grow. You want to direct your own growth and, and learning. Mm. So I think that's lovely feedback, though, babe, that you've given us that... that we're he- moving from our head to our heart, which is what Julianne pointed out Fred is doing by now. Yeah. So I'm really glad to hear that. And yeah. Um, yeah, and hopefully we'll have, we're not planning to go very far away for a while. <laughs> so hopefully we can have regular book groups. I'd like to, I haven't told Joy yet, but I'd like to book the hall for next Thursday at three if we can. So that will be a week and a day from today. Yeah. 
Um, and then we might have a couple of weeks in Kyabra, but we'll record sessions there and then we'll be back here. So hopefully we'll go week by week for a while now. So thanks for your patience. I know we've been off for a while. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs>